Shall we rise up as we pray? Our Father, we thank you because of the provision which you have made for us in the Bible. We thank you because the church started in great power with your manifest presence. And it is your intention to continue that, to continue that same thing with the church, that the church will still have that same presence, that same power, that same prominence of the Holy Ghost in our midst. And Father, we are praying that your promise as well as a prophecy concerning the outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon the true church will be ours today in Jesus' name. Amen. We know the Holy Ghost is likened to fire. And when fire burns, the effect of the heat and the burning is noticed. The Holy Ghost is likened unto oil. And when that oil of anointing is poured upon a king or priest or prophet, the life of that king, priest, or prophet will never more be the same. The Holy Ghost is likened to the wind, and when that wind blows, whithersoever it listeth, there is effect in the swaying of the trees and the moving of everything that is movable. And so, Father, we are praying as the Holy Ghost comes upon us and within us, we are praying that the change will be manifest to every one of us. Manifest to the church and manifest to the community around us in Jesus' name. Amen. When the Holy Ghost comes, He comes with gifts to be bestowed upon the children of our Heavenly Father. And we are children by the washing of the blood of Jesus. We're children because we have confessed our sins, forsaken them, and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, this inheritance is ours. This promise is ours. The gifts the Holy Ghost is bringing is also ours. And therefore we are praying that as he comes, as we open the door, as we yield to him, as we drink full of the Holy Ghost, that he will also empower us, energize us, and fill us and saturate us with the gifts in Jesus' name. But then when you give the gifts to the early church, you also give them the wisdom to use the gift in a way that will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ today as you fill us, as you empower us, as you give us gifts. Give us also the wisdom to be able to use every gift to the glory of God, in the will of God, to the salvation of souls, and to the building up and defining of the body of Christ. This we know you have done, for you are a prayer answering God. Since we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. We're happy again to be here this evening to study in the present series on Acts of the Apostles. I'm so happy because of your attitude in wanting to take in the Word of God and drink in the Word of God. In fact, as we preach, as we study, as we pray, it will be the normal thing for God to pour his gift of the Holy Ghost on you because you have that desire, that expectation, and God never neglects anybody that comes in great faith and great expectation. The studies we have been having in the Acts of the Apostles I've been opening our eyes to what the Holy Ghost does when he comes upon a sanctified believer. Already we have uh, seen from chapter 1 and chapter 2. And today we're looking at verses 14 to 36 of Acts chapter 2. Already now, as you have known, the believers have received the promise of the Father they have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. You know that already, that to be baptized means to be dipped or immersed in the Holy Ghost. They were covered all over. They were immersed. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ promised. According to Luke chapter 24, Verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but 
tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. In chapter 1 of Acts, as he gave them the promise, he himself used the language of being baptized with the Holy Ghost in verse 4, chapter 1, Acts. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye have heard of me. In verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but ye, my disciples, who are already saved and sanctified, shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. In obedience to what Jesus commanded, in expectation of the promise of the Father, they waited in Jerusalem, in the upper room. And in chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, a blast from heaven. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, verse 4 is sometimes surprising to people because, you know, it says they were all filled and they say maybe God has changed today. He doesn't do the same thing today because, you know, we all come together and he doesn't feel everybody because it says they were all filled. Let me tell you a difference between us now and the people of that time. You ought to know this. You see, the disciples of Jesus Christ had seen him and met him when he was still on the face of the earth. There was no stranger among them. There was no newcomer among them. You heard when my brother said, if you are coming for the first time, can you please rise up? And some people rose up. There was nobody like that at that time. All the people had met Jesus Christ, seen Jesus Christ. These people had been saved. In fact, they had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. He had prayed for them that they will be sanctified. And they had been having some meetings. This wasn't the first meeting they were having. When Jesus rose from the dead, he had been appearing to them in the group together. They had seen him, talked with him, ate, eaten with him. And, you know, they were waiting already. It says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, many of them, 120, they were always one accord in one place. But to see in a meeting today, because we're obeying the Lord, we bring in newcomers. We bring in those who have never been in a meeting like this before. We bring in those who have not, you know, heard what we have said in chapter 1 and also in chapter 2. So they just meet us in the middle. But, you know, at that time, there was nothing like that. All the 120 were well prepared. So that's one reason that it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Let me show you another reason. I told you before that the day of Pentecost was a general, to the general knowledge of the Jews. You see, the Jews for many, many years had been meeting together from all over the nations where they were scattered. They'll come back home. They'll come back to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, it was, you know, a happy time, a joyful time. It was to them a time of a festival when all the villagers come back home. When all the women come back home, it was a time of, you know, passing food around, a time of rejoicing together, going to the synagogue. Thousands of them, I told you before, as many as 120,000 or 180,000 could come together. They were greeting one another, shaking one another, rejoicing together. They were in a festival mood. If they, if they could dance, they'll be dancing. They'll be playing. They'll be praying. They'll, everything in the religious way. But you know, these 120, they didn't share in the mood of a festival. You think about it. 
If the whole town right now was in a festival mood, like, you know, just preparing for Christmas and everywhere singing Christmas carol, everywhere, you know, killing some goats or some sheep and passing rice and things like that, and some 120 people really eager to receive the Holy Ghost, they came together on one side. You can tell then, these people were saved, not only saved, they were steadfast, not only that, they were sanctified, not only that, they were consecrated, not only that, they were in great expectation. They were totally separated from the festive mood in the city, and they came together, even though they were a minority, they were expecting. That's why it says they were all filled. And all people like that today, who above all things are looking for that infilling of the Holy Ghost. They are saved, steadfast, sanctified, saturated with the word of God. They are really expecting the promise of the Father to come on them and they separate from all the happy mood of the society. They just want to get the power of the Lord just from him. They all will be filled with the Holy Ghost. And it says in verse 4, they began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, that's the experience they had, and it's called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And this baptism with the Holy Spirit had a great effect upon them. And today, you know, I told you before that it had an effect upon each believer. What effect? Well, they heard the sound of the wind, they heard Everybody speaking in tongues. They were speaking in tongues and their neighbors, I mean brothers and sisters, and they were together there speaking in tongues. And the fire came upon each of them. It had an effect on each baptized believer. It had an effect on the whole church. The whole church became so powerful, so confident, and so bold. And they became so dynamic in their faith. It had an effect on the community around because we're told in verse 5, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. It had that effect on the community around. It brought them together. But then when they came together, some, they were just surprised and amazed as to what was happening to these few people. I tell you, immediately they forgot the festival they came for. They forgot the Feast of Weeks that they were ce uh, celebrating. And they all came together to look and to see and to hear the miracle, the great impact of the Holy Ghost that came upon the 120 believers. But some of them, even though they were amazed and surprised, some of them were mocking. They said, these people are full of new wine. Verses 12 and 13. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Now, when they said that, Peter the apostle had to rise up. With the 11, making 12. You see, Matthias had been selected according to the will of God in chapter 1. And Matthias had been accepted and approved by God. And now we have Peter and the 11, making 12. So Matthias has to be there. So they rose up and now an explanation is going to be given. And so you have the first message ever preached by a human being. In the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why it's important you are here today. How should we preach? What is the example we have in preaching? And you know many people who say they have the Holy Ghost who cannot preach. When they preach, they are not coherent. They are not logical. They are not sound. They are not scriptural. And they say it's the Holy Ghost that makes them to preach like that. But when the Holy Ghost comes upon a preacher... He'll make you to preach and to teach. And he'll make you to impart both doctrine and truth. And here we have the first sermon ever given after the people received the Holy Ghost. But then in this message, he's explaining 
the predicted Pentecost. He's exalting the perfect springs. He's exhibiting the proper power and he's exemplifying Pentecostal preaching. He's going to give us an explanation of what has happened to them on the day of Pentecost. After that, he is going to give us the exaltation of the perfect prince, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, is we're going to see him as he gives us the exhibition of the proper power that came upon him after the Holy Ghost had come. And after that, we're going to see the example of what it means to preach in the power of Pentecost. First, explaining the predicted Pentecost. They had received an experience, and watch this. This is important for you and for me. We should never desire any experience which we cannot explain with the scriptures. Mark it down. You should never desire, you should never pray for any experience which you cannot explain with the Bible. And so they had received this wonderful experience. But it was an heaven-sent experience, a promised experience. It was given by the Lord Jesus Christ, the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. And this thing came upon them. Some onlookers, observers, were mocking. Some were surprised. And Peter rose up to say, why are you surprised? Why are you mocking? We are not fanatics. Neither are we drunk. We can give you chapter and verse for what has happened to us. We're not just running after signs. What is happening to us this day of Pentecost has a full explanation from the Bible. And so he tells us in chapter 2 verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. And said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all that all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you. And I came to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. I told you before, that's about nine o'clock in the morning. And no Jew will eat or drink before nine o'clock in the morning, especially on a Sabbath day or on a day of the feast, especially on this Pentecost day. And he told them, we are not drunk. You are Jews. You know that no Jew can be drunk at the third hour of the day. But this is that. That's the explanation. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He referred to the scriptures. What is happening to us today, you can find in the Bible. That's what he said. And it shall come to pass. In the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on, your, on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now you say, why is um, Peter mentioning that as well? Well, you must realize that they needed an explanation of everything that was taking place. You know, they had spoken in tongues. The Spirit had come upon them. And this to the Jews around, uh, you know, was totally strange. And he said, well, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, you have heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind. You've seen the powers of nature moved. Well, he said, don't you remember what Joel said? He said, I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now, you see, these people had had tongues like fire up, upon every one of them. And he said, don't be surprised about that. Don't you remember that the prophecy of Joel included a vapor of smoke and even fire and blood? This is only the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on those who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, well, the whole has not even happened. 
If what is happening today on the day of Pentecost is surprising you, what will you do when the sun shall be turned into darkness? What will you say if today you are mocking, if today you are surprised? How will you feel when the moon is turned into blood? And that must happen before the great and notable day of the Lord shall come. And he says, while all that is happening, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He gave an explanation of what happened to them. And he referred to Joel in the things that happened. Now let me uh, say this, bring it back to us today. Deeper Christian Life Ministry, here in the fellowship. You know, many times we come together on a Thursday, and the Holy Ghost begins to move. And you stand there praying, and some of us are sick. Some of us, maybe your wife is run away from home. And for some of us, the child is sick in the hospital. For some of us, it may be that your, um, somebody owes you money and it has not been paid. For some of us, it may be that we are poor and we are praying for God to provide. And I stand here and I, I pray. And I begin to reveal in the congregation what needs we have in the congregation. And we say somebody is there, we are sick. Another person is there whose wife has run away and want to pray that the wife will come back. We say another person is there, the child is sick in the hospital. We even sometimes mention the word and the room number of the word. And we say now we'll pray and that thing will happen. We say somebody has run away, we're going to pray. And when the person is overpowered by the Holy Ghost and is coming back, I tell, say, yes, I see the person coming. Now if sometimes, you know, people come to a midst and they're surprised. And they say, how, how do they do that? Is that of God? Is that true? If Peter explained what happened to them on the day of Pentecost, then we must be able to explain what is happening to us every day. We have revival and healing and miracle and the manifestation of the power of God. And I, I want to give you a small explanation from the Bible, explaining the experience we too, which we have. Already you know that if you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues. And you already see the confirmation in the Bible. But now when you get into the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading there from verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with us. That's to profit the church, the sick. To profit those who are distressed and discouraged. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. To profit the saints of God and even the sinners that come to the fellowship. In verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. What is called the word of knowledge there is the impartation of knowledge in a supernatural way. What the preachers know, natural means of knowing. And I show you examples from the Bible. In 2 Kings, chapter 4. I'm reading there in verse 27. A woman had a problem and came to Elisha, the man of God. And the, the woman was so sorrowful. In verse, uh, chapter 4 of 2 Kings, verse 26. Run now. I pray thee to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And, he, and she answered, It is well. She didn't tell Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, what was wrong. Verse 27. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came, near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone, for, sh for her soul is vexed within her. For the Lord, as he did from me, and has not told me. That means there are times the Lord will tell the man of God. There are times the Lord will not tell the man of God. In this case, the Lord had not told the man of God. So the woman herself had to make the sin known about the child that was dead. And the man of God prayed and the child revived. But now let's see when the man of God knew. This time he didn't know. Let's see when he knew. Chapter 5. I'm reading verse 20. 2 Kings 5, 20. 
But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman, the Syrian, in not receiving at his hand that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. And he went secretly. Now verse 25. But he went in and stood before his master. He had gone to Naaman. He had got what he wanted to get. Then he came back. He never allowed Elisha to know. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. Have been around all the time. Verse 26. And he said, Went not mine heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money, and to receive garments, and oliviers, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, and men servants, and maid servants? He knew. That's the revelation of the word of knowledge. Chapter 6 of Second Kings. From verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel, and took counsel with his servant, saying, In such and such a place shall my camp be. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for see that the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him of, and saved him there, not once, not twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was so troubled for this sin. And he called the servant and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Every time I plan strategy to, to take and capture the king of Israel, somebody tells him and he, av he avoids and escapes. Now you must tell me. Among our people here, who goes to tell the king of Israel? Look at verse 12. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha. The prophet that is in Israel, tell us the king of Israel, the word that thou speakest in thy bed chamber. That's the revelation. That's the word of knowledge in the life of that man of God. You remember, I'll not be able to read because of time. Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar dreamt a dream. He woke up, he was troubled. He forgot all about it. He was so troubled that he called the magicians and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans together. And he said, I've dreamt a dream. It has troubled me so much. And I want you to tell me the dream because I've forgotten and the interpretation thereof. And he said, no king had ever asked anybody such a thing before. You tell us the dream and then we'll tell you the interpretation. He said, no, but I've forgotten if you don't show me, then I'll kill you, cut you in pieces, and then I'll make your houses dung heal. Daniel heard about it with his friends and companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, uh, you know, this man of God, Daniel, told Ariok, he said, Why is the commandment so hasty from the king? Tell him to wait until tomorrow, and we'll show him the dream. And he and his friends and companions prayed. Uh, during the night and the Lord showed him the dream and the interpretation and in the morning he called Ariok and he said bring me to Nebuchadnezzar I will show him that dream that he forgot how did Daniel know? that's the revelation again that's the word of knowledge you must remember in the life of Samuel the Saul was looking for asses that were lost he searched and he couldn't find. And you know, somebody told him, a servant said, well, why don't you let us see a seer? Because in the days, in the olden days, the prophets were called seers. They came to Samuel. And then Samuel told Saul that the ass that he was looking for, the asses had been found. And then he should wait till tomorrow because he's going to tell him all that is in his heart. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 19. So you can see the word of knowledge in the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? You remember Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. And uh, the woman wanted the water of life. And Jesus said, go and call your husband. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus then by the word of knowledge said, you've spoken well. Because you've had five husbands before. And the person you are staying with now is not your husband. How did Jesus know that this woman had had five husbands before? Word of knowledge. 
You know, at, at another time, Nathaniel had been called to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, can a good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. And as Jesus saw Nathaniel coming, Jesus just, uh, you know, called out to him. That's in John chapter 1, from verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming unto him, and he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Who told you about myself, about me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the tree, I saw thee. What's that? The gift of the word of knowledge. Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 5. I'm looking at it from verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now this man came pretending. But Peter in verse 3 said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Peter knew. How did he know? The gift of the word of knowledge. And you find many examples in the New Testament. There's the example of Ananias, another Ananias, uh, who was told where Saul of Tarsus, where he was praying, what he was doing, and that Jesus had appeared to him in the way. How did Ananias know? the word of knowledge. So we have explained today what is taking place here, so you will know that what is happening in our midst here is of the Holy Ghost. And it is because the Lord again is pouring out his spirit and is manifesting the gifts. And there are more gifts that have been manifested here, but I've just explained that unto you. Now, Peter went into preaching. Every good sermon must have an introduction then it must have the real body of the message. Then there must be a conclusion. He has not given the introduction. They have all come together. And he has given them the introduction saying, Why are you surprised? Now he must give us the body of the message. And in the body of the message, he is exalting the perfect prince. From verse 22, Acts chapter 2. Verse 22. Let's see a sermon. His message. And see that in this message, he has so wonderfully exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark this now. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, the Holy Ghost will not exalt a man. The Holy Ghost will exalt Jesus Christ. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, the Holy Ghost will not even point attention to himself. That's what the Holy Ghost will point attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first message preached in Pentecostal power, exalted and lifted up the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. What's he doing? He's telling them about one, the life of Jesus, two, the death of Jesus. You see, when you are preaching, except you are preaching about the life of Jesus, his perfect sinless life, except you are preaching the life of Jesus, his power, to work miracles and to save and to forgive from sins, except you are pointing out what he did in his life and at his death and in his resurrection, you are not preaching a full message. And already we are being told here that the real example of preaching is that Christ will be exalted. And he said, Christ, Jesus Christ is of Nazareth. I want to tell you that's what they didn't want to hear. They didn't want to hear that Jesus was the Son of God and is the Son of God. They didn't want to hear that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. They did not want to hear that Jesus is a Savior. And that is why they crucified him just about 50 days before this time, less than two months. And then he said, you killed him, you crucified him, and you have slain him. Verse 24, whom God raised up, has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, 
because it was not possible that you should be holding of age. What's that? Resurrection. In a single message, he's telling them about the life of Christ, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you that this is bold preaching because it was being noticed about in Jerusalem that the body of Jesus was stolen. That's what the uh, chief priests and, you know, all those people, what they were telling people, oh, they said, his disciples came and stole him away. But Peter rose up and he said, you know that your high priest is telling a lie. You know that it's just the propagation of their wicked plot and program. Because that Jesus Christ, who was approved of God with mighty signs and miracles and wonders, whom you killed, is risen from the dead. He has risen and we know it and we're the witnesses. That's bold. And in verse 25, he must now link up that life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ with the Bible, with the Old Testament scriptures. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He called him the Lord. He's called him Jesus of Nazareth. Now he's calling him the Lord. For he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Hades. Neither wilt thou suffer thine only one to see corruption. Thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you. Or of the patriarch David that is both dead and buried and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, he's now going to give an explanation. What is preaching? Preaching is giving the quotation from the Bible and then giving the interpretation and explanation. Are you going to preach at the retreat time? That's how to preach. One, there must be an introduction. Two, there must be the body of the message. And three, there must be the conclusion. And four, there must be the appeal. To the people to come and give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you find Peter here doing all the four. One introduction to the uh, body of the message. And three the conclusion and four the appeal. And so if you are going to preach. You are going to tell other people about the wonderful salvation that God has given us. You are preaching about Jesus Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And the glory that shall come. And now in verse uh, 30. Therefore. Being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He has seen this before speak of the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ. That his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he himself, he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. That's the message. But you know, you never end the message without bringing the conclusion. The conclusion is just, you know, applying it to them. Applying it to the people so they will know where they are guilty. And yet you must reveal salvation and pardon and the freedom that they can receive. You must reveal everything to them. And so he said, therefore, in the conclusion, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this, that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. They're expecting the Messiah, that's the Messiah. The anointed of God, and his Lord. And he can be Lord over your life. So he told them about salvation, about the free gift that we have. In this, he really exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus said the Holy Ghost will do when he comes. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus did say that when the Holy Ghost is come, he'll do something, and he did it. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He shall teach you all things and bring all and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I said unto you. Can you see how the scriptures were brought into the remembrance of Peter when the Holy Ghost came upon him? And in chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from my Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He shall testify of me. And you see how wonderfully well Peter received the Holy Ghost and he testified through the power of the Holy Ghost of the Lord Jesus Christ about his life, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation, his, ascens his ascension about the salvation and the forgiveness he has brought and about what the sacrifice on Calvary what has done for them and he convicted them about their sin you crucified him I you know in John chapter 16 verse 7 Jesus said that when the Holy Ghost is come he'll bring conviction of sin nevertheless I tell you the truth it is expedient for you that I go away for if I go not away the comforter will not come unto you but if I depart I will send him unto you and when he is come look at this he will reprove the world of sin that means he'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me and so these people were convicted of their sin. Now, let's just uh, remind you quickly that he exhibited the proper power. I read it to you before in earlier studies in Micah chapter 3 verse 8. The effect on a preacher. When the Holy Ghost comes upon a preacher. And in Micah chapter 3 verse 8, there it says, but truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Now you say, but I am not a preacher. I'm just a singer. Or you say, I'm not a preacher. I'm just in the prayer warriors. That is, I'm one of those who pray. Or you say, I'm not in the choir, and, and I'm not among the prayer warriors. The only thing I do is that I just give my testimony. That's all I have chance to do. Listen to me. Whatever you are doing, whether you are preaching, or testifying, or witnessing, or just singing, or praying, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, it makes a wonderfully great difference. You know, Peter preached before this time. He prayed before this time. They had been singing before this time. They had been doing a number of things before this time. But when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they did it with a difference. They exhibited proper power. Again, you must follow me. When it comes to preaching, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, look at verse 14 again. This exhibiting the proper power after the Holy Ghost has come. But Peter... Standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. Why oh, am I reading that again since we read that before? It's just to remind you and to tell you that he did not prepare the message. You know, he didn't have, you know, ten days, twenty days, three weeks to prepare this message. He didn't have any outline in his hand. But you know, as the people gathered together, a crowd had gathered. Thousands of people. There was no microphone. There were no ushers. There was nobody singing. There was nobody at all. In fact, he wasn't ready in the physical. He wasn't ready if we were to talk of the natural. But he was ready and prepared in the spiritual. And when he saw the crowd, he rose up. And you see, he lifted up his voice. You wonder why, why I shout? That's why I shout. I lift up my voice. That's verse 14. He lifted up his voice so that everybody will hear. And that's what we do when we preach. And you cannot preach with the power of the Holy Ghost and then you are talking here and people cannot hear, even with the microphone. He had power. And then in verse 36, he brought the conclusion on them and with the power of the Holy Ghost, he told them, you crucified the Lord. What was the effect of that preaching? Verse 37, now. 
when they had this, they were preached in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's Pentecostal preaching. Pentecostal preaching has power. Power to convict. Power to send you on your knees. Power to desire forgiveness and to desire and want salvation. The power of that preaching just made them to want to repent from being murderers unto being saints of God. But I said, if you are not preaching, but you are praying, your prayer becomes more effective when the Holy Ghost is upon you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit, but the Spirit, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You find a man that has the Holy Ghost praying and sweating. How is that? Is the power of the Holy Ghost in praying. You find him just groaning. You find him praying for a whole city, praying for a whole nation, praying for a whole state. That's praying in the Holy Ghost. And it goes beyond the normal English language in praying, goes beyond the vernacular in, pr in praying, and it goes to another language, diverse kinds of tongues, and intercedes et for people unknown to him. He intercedes for problems not yet revealed unto him. He is speaking in tongues, he is praying in the Spirit, and it makes a difference in your prayer when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And I'm reading there in verse 25 and verse 26. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Remember, these people were saved and singing. They were sanctified and singing. Then they were baptized in the Holy Ghost and singing. Well, there's a type of singing before you receive the Holy Ghost. You sing and, well, you're happy when you sing. But after the Holy Ghost has come, your singing will work miracles. Because we are told in verse 26, when the people that were baptized in the Holy Ghost were singing in the midnight, only a duet. Paul and Silas, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaking. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. That's Pentecostal singing. You know, that, that's why when you are singing choruses, and you, people don't know that as we're preaching on the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost comes upon us, if we're singing choruses, it doesn't matter. Your bands that bind you, the bondage that is binding you, keeping you down, will just be broken in pieces. The fetters of the devil, the depression, the discouragement, will just melt away as Holy Ghost anointed people are singing. Now in Acts chapter 26, there Paul was not preaching. What was he doing? He was just giving a testimony. Have you ever given your testimony anywhere? I mean, at home? You meet somebody in the office? Somebody in the market? Or somebody in the church here? Or you come on Thursday to give your testimony? It's wonderful whatever the Lord has done for you to give testimony. But I'm telling you that Paul had received the Holy Ghost and he gave testimony. From verse 1 he was talking and on and on. He kept on talking, just telling his testimony. I know he got to a part in the testimony that in verse 24, chapter 26, verse 24, as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, he stopped him in the middle. You know, that man was excited. He said, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning has made you mad. Just giving testimony, not preaching. Just testimony. And uh, Paul replied him in the middle of the testimony. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. He didn't allow him to answer. As a Holy Ghost man. 
giving testimony then somebody shouted you are mad he replied i am not mad then he said king agrippa do i look like a madman don't you believe the prophet oh yes i know you believe wonderful man you see when the holy ghost comes upon you whether you are singing or praying or preaching or giving testimony whatever you are doing you do it with power I'm um, going to, to the last point, which is exemplifying Pentecostal preaching. You see, in the book of Acts, we have a record of apostolic Pentecostal preaching. You want to know how to preach? Come on and let's study together in Acts of the Apostles. And I'll be teaching you in the Acts of the Apostles as we study on how to preach, because the book is totally full of preaching. Let's see, let's see some references. Chapter 2, verse 14 again. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. That's preaching. Chapter 3, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Already I started preaching again. Or why look ye so honestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, and the God of our fathers has glorified his son Jesus. You see preaching? He has started exalting again the perfect prince. He's talking about Jesus again. He's going to call him Christ and Lord, and he's going to just exalt him. And when I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. In chapter in chapter 5 chapter 4 verse 2 being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead chapter 5 verse 19 and verse 20 but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said go stand and speak in the temple to all the people the words of this life that's preaching and in chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 Sorry, chapter 5, verse 42, daily in the temple. And in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Verse 25. Verse 25. And they, when they testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Well, in many, chap many chapters in the Acts, we have preaching. But you see, Peter has already exemplified for us how to preach. I've told you already that the message must have an introduction. And there are many ways to make an introduction. In this particular case, there was confusion. You know, they gathered together, they were confused, and Peter wanted to give an explanation to their confusion. Sometimes in preaching, in your introduction, you confuse the people. How do you confuse them? For example, you're preaching on salvation. You tell them that some people say that you can get saved this way. Others say you can get saved this way. Others say you can get this, this way. Then you, ex you just tell a number of ways in which people say they can get saved. Already right, people are confused. And they want to know which is the right way. Then you give the answer. And that is what Peter did here. There was a confusion. They didn't know what was happening to the disciples. And because of the confusion, he started the introduction of his message on the basis of that confusion. And he built up in a logical way. Now, if we're preaching correctly, the preaching of the gospel must be scriptural, and it was scriptural. It must be coherent and logical, and you can see that he was very logical here. As he talked about the life first, then the death after, then the resurrection after that, then the ascension after that. You know, he didn't talk of the ascension after that and then talk about uh, the death and then talk about resurrection and then talk about the life of Jesus. He was orderly. So in our preaching, in building of the message, we must be scriptural, coherent, logical and orderly. And then he was convincing and direct. And yet he was not offensive. He was not impolite or rude. Look at verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. You see how he respected them. And he said, ye men of Israel, even though he was going to point out their sin, yet 
he showed respect unto them. Can you turn with me to Acts chapter 7? And see another person as he preached. He showed respect. And so when we preach, even though we're convincing, even though we're logical and scriptural, we must not be impolite or rude. Verses 1 and 2, chapter 7 of Acts. Then said the high priest, at these things so? He was asking Stephen. And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. You see, he respected them. It was going to be direct, it was going to be convincing, and it was going to be very logical and scriptural, but he paid honor and respect to whom honor and respect was due. And he said, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. When he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Karan, and he said, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. And so we can see that when we preach in Pentecostal power, according to the Pentecostal apostolic fashion, it must be convincing and direct, but not offensive. It must be polite and persuasive. It must exalt Christ, reveal salvation, and convict sinners. And today, the promise of the Holy Ghost is still available to us. Because uh, you'll be seeing next, next uh, Monday, as we come to the mighty, wonderful promise that Peter gave to the people, but I'll just read it to you today in verses 37 to verse 39. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you. And to your children. And to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so today, we have exalted Jesus Christ. And if you are not saved yet, Jesus Christ has been crucified for our sins. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And tonight, if you'll call on the name of the Lord, he'll save you. If what you are looking for is purity of heart, sanctification, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you are thirsty and hungry after the righteousness, he will fill you. Whatsoever you desire when you pray, you come, you call upon him, you, you believe, and you'll be purified and sanctified, you'll receive. And then if you have been saved and sanctified, there's nothing you are waiting for actually because it says you can receive the Holy Ghost baptism even tonight because the promise is unto you. Can I hear you say the promise is unto me? The promise is unto me. Because I'm a child of God. And because God has called me. Tonight I'm going to receive. Now you stand up and ask the Lord. He will fill you today to overflowing. As the Lord commands you, bring your vessels not a few. He'll fill your heart today to overflowing. 